So we talked about uh, the wavelength at which the absorption occurs tells us about the energy between the levels. So in cases where the D1 and the D9 were our simple cases, we could kind of just look at the energy for those transitions because you only had one type of transition. We could get the energy related to the separation between the EG and the T2G orbitals. But when you had various ways that you can arrange those electrons and you have to worry about these states, we had to go to the tanabe sugano diagrams to get information between the distance of the splitting between the EG and the T2G orbitals. Okay, so the wavelength at which the absorption occurs tells us about the energy between the levels. Now we want to look at the intensity and the information that gives us about the type of excitation, and that gets us into selection rules. So again, where the transitions occur, so where the maxima occur, relate to the energy associated with the electrons being absorbed. The intensity here, the y-axis, so if we're talking about Beer's law, A equals E, B, C. So B is the path link, C is the concentration. If we keep those parameters constant, we're just looking at the molar absorptivity, that, that molar absorptivity gives us information about the type of excitation that's occurring. So this is why it's important to find the molar absorptivity. So if we're looking at this case here, so notice as we go from the 4 to the 2, remember we said that that wasn't allowed. This would be a spin forbidden transition because you're changing the multiplicity of the electrons. So you're going from a quartet to a doublet. So this is a spin forbidden transition. So notice that they had to magnify this region of the spectra for you even to see it. So this was an, an allowed transition. And here when we have the D to D, these are spin allowed, so we're going from quartets to quartets, so these are fine this way, but there are other selection rules that we're breaking, and we'll talk about those later. And then notice that over here we have the charge transfer. This is much larger, this is going off scale. So we've got different levels of intensity, and this tells us about different types of excitations that are occurring. So a spin for bin transition, a D to D type transition, or maybe a metal to ligand type transfer, known as a charge transfer. Okay, so let's look at three selection rules. The first one is that a change in L value of plus or minus one gives you allowed transitions. So D to D or S to D isn't okay. So D to D you'd have an L value of 2 going to 2, so it has to be a plus or minus 1 for it to be allowed. Or an S to D, you're going from a, a 0 to a 2, so you're skipping the P in between, so that's not okay. But an S to a P, or a P to a D, or a D and an F, that's all okay. Our second rule is the Laporte selection rule, and this has to do with transitions between states of the same parity. So when we're talking about states of the same parity, we're talking about symmetry with respect to inversion. So those are forbidden. So this rule only applies to centrosymmetric molecules, meaning those that have an inversion center, so something like an octahedral complex. So what does this mean? So remember those labels on the side, like the T2G of the octahedral complex in the the EG. So G to G transitions are forbidden. If you have a U to U, those are also forbidden. But if you go from a G to a U, grata to ungrata, or ungrata to grata, those are allowed. Now notice if we go back and look at the tetrahedral, remember tetrahedral doesn't have an inversion center, so we don't have to worry about that. So if we look up at the, uh, the splitting diagram for a tetrahedral, you have the three up top. So remember this is the T2 and the other label. At the bottom is just an E. So you may not remember these labels, but if you refer back to your character table, you can see those labels. These don't have G and U assignments made to them because they don't have an inversion center. So this is why, and we'll explain later, um, that tetrahedral complexes are usually darker than octahedrals because you don't have to worry about breaking this Laporte selection rule because it doesn't apply to tetrahedral complexes.
And then the third selection rule is that a change in S, capital S, so that's that spin value, is zero for allowed transitions. So this is why we talk about that multiplicity has to stay the same. So you can't have, you know, go from one unpaired electron to two unpaired electrons or one to three. You've got to keep the same number of unpaired electrons to keep this spin selection rule. So if we're talking about a transition between this quartet A2 state and the quartet T1, this is spin allowed because you've got a four here and a four here. But if we're going from a quartet A2 state to a doublet A2 state, since these numbers are different, this is spin forbidden. Now, you can have some relaxing of the selection rules. So even though we know that there are some selection rules that say those transitions aren't supposed to happen, they do occur somewhat. And what's going on is some of the bonds in transition metals complexes, they're not rigid and they're undergoing vibrations. And when they undergo those vibrations and those movements, they temporarily change the symmetry. So imagine those molecules stretching and moving and bending. You're temporarily changing the symmetry of those molecules and it's relaxing the selection rules. Also, tetrahedral complexes are typically darker than octahedral complexes. This is because in tetrahedral complexes, you're only breaking one of three rules. So if we're talking about having the, the T2 and the E, so we don't have to worry about the, the spin selection rule, and we're not worried about breaking the port selection rule, but we are breaking the D to D transition rule. So you, you're breaking one of rule. But in the octahedral case, you're breaking two rules. You're breaking the D to D rule, and you're breaking the the G to G rule that says that those aren't supposed to happen, but yet they do, and we see evidence of those in the UV vis spectrum. Now, the other part we want to look at when we're talking about the relaxing of the selection rules, there's the heavy atom effect. And spin orbit coupling in some cases provides a way of relaxing the spin selection rule. And this phenomenon is more important for the second and the third row transition metals. So this is when you start seeing the spin forbidden selection rules being disobeyed. Now let's talk about charge transfer bands. These are really intense peaks in your spectra. This is because you're not violating any rules. Charge transfer bands arise from the movement of electrons between orbitals that are predominantly metal in character and predominantly ligand in character. And they're pretty easy to identify. They're very intense, and they're going to be sensitive to the solvent polarity. So if you change the polarity of the solvent, you can see some shifting of those peaks. Now, let's just, I'm going to start off by looking at ligand to metal charge transfers, so LMCT. So ligands have lone pairs of relatively high energies, so like sulfur and selenium. And then you have the low-lying empty metal orbitals, so metals in high oxidation states. So this is when you're going to have the um, ligand donating electron density onto the metal, and you have that charge transfer, so that excitation. So if we're talking about the ligand to metal charge transfer, you're talking about these predominantly ligand-based orbitals to the, to the metal here. So this is what these red lines are looking at right here. So those are ligand to metal charge transfer. Now you can also have metal to ligand charge transfer. This is when you have metals in low oxidation states. So if you have a metal in a low oxidation state, they're going to be very electron rich. So if it's very electron rich, you're going to have a lot of full orbitals here. And those electrons are going to be able to donate it into metals, into orbitals that are more ligand in character. So you have a metal to ligand charge transfer. And this is typically going to happen when you have low-lying acceptor orbitals like cyanide and carbon monoxide, or CO ligands. OK, so I'm going to look at some typical ranges of some molar absorptivities and how those intensities of the spectroscopic bands um, relate to those uh, values of the, of the extinction coefficients. So if you're looking at a spin forbidden type of transition or a band or a peak in your spectrum, 
your extinction co coefficient is going to be less than 1. So if you recall that spectrum that we looked at at the beginning, where they had to blow up the region to see that transition, yeah, it had a very small extinction coefficient. Now if we're looking at something that's Laporte forbidden, so it has an inversion center and you're looking at disobeying the D to D rules, so it's, think about an octahedral complex, those extinction coefficients are going to be in the range of like 20 to 100 inverse molar inverse centimeter. Now if we're talking about Laporte allowed, so tetrahedral complexes where you're violating the D to D rule but no inversion center, remember we said that those complexes are typically darker or more intense, that's signified by this higher extinction coefficient of that molar absorptivity. So around 250 is typical for some of these tetrahedral type complexes. Now if it's symmetry allowed or we have charge transfer and we're not breaking any of those selection rules, then we're talking about extinction coefficients of ranging from 1,000 to 50,000. So you can kind of see how the measuring the molar absorptivity or the extinction coefficient can give us information about the types of excitations that we're seeing in our spectra. Okay, so our last slide. Notice here we have a cobalt 2 plus and this is a tetrahedral type complex. And so if we're trying to let's see the cobalt 2 plus the scene time varies Cro-Magnum man feeds constantly nickel, copper, zinc. Okay, so there's my my row of the, the the first row of the, the transition metals and how I memorize them. So uh, ignore the, the crazy sayings, but that's how I know which order they're in. So cobalt, so it's so scanning one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So that is a D7 for that cobalt 2 plus. So we're looking at a tetrahedral. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So we've got three unpaired electrons. And if we're looking at the octahedral, so again, this is also a cobalt 2 plus. And here we have the splitting, the two on top, three on the bottom. And this is water. Water is always going to be a high spin, especially in the 2 plus oxidation state. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Okay, so if we look at this, we can kind of figure out which spectrum corresponds to which cobalt complex. And what you're actually looking at, this, this pink here is of cobalt, and you've seen the, the material in Desca that changes color when it gets wet. So with the cobalt complex in the Desca material, uh, when it's really dry, is this darker blue, and this is a tetrahedral complex. And when it gets wet, those chlorides are replaced with water molecules. So you've got the water ligands here, and the color changes to this pink color. So notice the difference in the intensity of these two. So remember the cobalt, when you have the excitation, you're only breaking one rule. So the cobalt is darker. So the cobalt corresponds to this complex here. But the lighter, this lighter pink, is the octahedral complex here. So the intensity of these peaks we can kind of base on the selection rules and we see this change in geometry. And that gives us information about the types of selection rules. So the intensity of the absorptions of these helps us figure out which one is which. But we can also use the wavelength at which these occur. So notice that, you know, we have some wavelengths somewhere in the middle here, so let's see, 400, so about 550 for this, for the, uh, the octahedral complex, and let's say six, uh, 650 for the other. The octahedral complex is absorbing around 550 nanometers. And remember, water is a weak filled ligand but the chloride is a weaker field ligand. So we'd expect the chlorides to split the orbitals less. Also too, 
remember tetrahedral only has four things around it so we even expect even smaller splitting so there's smaller splitting which means larger wavelength so the tetrahedral complex we'd expect to have a smaller splitting so it would require less energy longer wavelength because remember E equals HC over lambda so the energy is inversely proportional so smaller splitting larger wavelength and then the octahedral complex which should have a greater splitting would require a shorter wavelength of light so a lot of good analysis can come out of this one example so as you go through this, think about what kind of questions you may have, and we'll discuss those in class.